I just I like having just a constant buzz of contentment. <laughs> <laughs> it would be wonderful to live in your world for a couple days. Welcome to Second Opinion, the review show here on the Nexus. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I am joined by Meg Griffin, so we can talk about The City We Became, a novel by N.K. Jemisin. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO105. So a quick description of the premise behind this novel. Um, in, in this universe, each city here on planet Earth uh, when it gets to a certain point, when it becomes its own identity, right? When it kind of figures out who, like, what kind of personality that particular city has, um, one person from that city becomes the avatar of that city. So they they are basically chosen kind of by the universe to like embody everything that that uh, that that city stands for, and. Um, the catch, the the challenge here is that uh, there are like extra dimensional beings that don't want this to happen, and so they try to stop uh, cities from from realizing their potential in this way, uh, and and uh, things you know get rather violent, um, and the battles between uh, our you know our cities and uh, and these extra dimensional beings kind of manifest them, themselves in ways that. That, that we as normal humans perceive uh, as as kind of ordinary like social disturbances mostly and um, yeah so in this case uh, in the city we became uh, it focuses on New York City which is going through this process and unlike most cities uh, New York has five distinct boroughs that uh, each get their own avatar with their own personalities. And so we get to see all of those characters interacting with each other as well as trying to fight these extra dimensional forces. I'm super excited for this review, especially Megan, because like you, were, I'm pretty sure you were the one who originally suggested that I get that that I start checking out NK's stuff. Um, it was either you or Alex. Somebody was talking about it in the Minds at York Discord server. I think it might have been this book that spurred a conversation about her, because uh, we definitely read some of her stuff earlier in 2020, which actually does feel like 10 years ago now. Of her stuff, and this book came up on my radar, and I think I was like, "This, I'm so excited for this book." And that led to Alex being like, well, she's done all this other stuff in podcast format, too. Yeah, yeah. And I remember being, like, super overwhelmed because, like, people were talking about the upcoming book. And then, like, she has mm -hmm. a different book series that, you know, is totally separate. But there's several books already out and, like, a bunch of short stories. And luckily, like, LeVar Burton reads. He's yes. read a few of those short stories for his podcast episode. So I was able to jump in, like with those shorter format, you know, in audio form, which is, you know, the medium that I am able to consume most of my stuff in. Same. Um, and, and yeah, oh my gosh, they were, those, those short stories were fantastic. And so I just very quickly realized like, oh, this is, yeah, I need to jump on this bandwagon immediately. Yeah, she's amazing. And a lot of what this book really is alluding to um, is that like, Especially the genres that she writes in, which are very much fantasy and a little bit sci-fi. I guess it kind of depends on where where that line is. But they are genres that were defined by white men. Mm -hmm. And she is a black woman. And how much she has turned everything over and like just a big middle finger, especially to Lovecraft in this book. Yeah. Uh, it just – I love it. I love her so much. I need to do more – um, I haven't started the th the fifth season, any of that yet. That's like my next go to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my I just got that from the library, so I'll be starting that series pretty soon. <laughs> I will read along with you when I can Sweet. find a copy of it. <laughs> um, yeah, and and what you were talking about with like taking on the the like themes and and attitudes of authors like hp lovecraft is like that is something that not only is she fighting against that like 
with the themes in her books, but also like directly there were a few scenes oh, yeah. in the book where like, you know, characters were calling out Lovecraft for being a piece of crap and, you know, being like super afraid of like people who live in the city and you know particular um ethnic groups i think like w- was it jews who he was like super i i mean he kind of hated everybody but he hated everybody yeah, <laughs> i okay. think so i don't i'm gonna be honest like lovecraft is someone that i grew up knowing was terrible so i've actually never read any lovecraft and have only read adaptations so i don't hmm. i i am a terrible english major from the standpoint of like I should probably know that history better, but also I don't care. Like, yeah. I am so fascinated with like what people have done with his stuff and taken and run with it, especially in 2020 where we've got Lovecraft Country also being a big thing right now. Sure. Yeah. I am really excited to get your take. Have you ever been to New York City? I have not, which okay. is actually like... I was really surprised by the fact that even though I've never been to the city and, you know, well, I mean, we do we do get a certain amount of like understanding of, of New York just from the, the fact that it dominates the media landscape, you know? Sure, of course. Like lots and lots of movies are set in New York City. And so you kind of get this vague notion of like, oh, yeah, there's like there's all, there's these different neighborhoods that like I should like when somebody says like they're in the Bronx, it like it, it's a shorthand for a particular kind of feeling. Mm-hmm. Um and and so so you pick up a little bit on that as a Midwesterner, but like, you know, <laughs> this but this book like really like she she was she was explicit enough in her descriptions of why like the characters who are embodying each of these boroughs like why their personalities make sense as representations of those boroughs, but it didn't feel like it was like hitting me over the head with it. That's good. That was kind of so. Jemison is more known for these like elaborate world building fantasy books. And so a lot of the reviews are kind of like, it's jarring to have this urban fantasy in New York City that is such like a known thing. And it kind of, I'm curious, like the level of knowledge of New York and how much that affects how people appreciate it. Because I loved it. This was like the love letter to the city that I just absolutely couldn't get enough of. And especially at a time where it was like I couldn't go out and explore. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons that I was excited to have you on this podcast in particular, because you have been living in New York City until very recently. You had been living in New York City for I don't know how many years, but five years. I did five years in Brooklyn, uh, worked in Manhattan, and I just I, I didn't get out and explore Staten Island um, for pretty basically the reasons that this book <laughs> tells you. Uh, and I didn't get out and explore Queens as much as I should have because it is a trek to go from Brooklyn to Queens. But um, everything that I did and everything about this book just reminds me like how much I love the city. And, and just like you said, how different neighborhoods were. I mean, like, even in my own little five mile radius, you've got probably six different neighborhoods and basically any ethnicity that you can think of. Yeah. Um, and and so you you said earlier during the conversation that like this this book felt very appropriate for like COVID times. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Sure. So this book came out March 24th. Um, which was about a week and a half after the city shut down. And in some ways, they're <laughs> the big evil in this book is very contagious. So that was really hitting oh, hard. Yeah. And the landscape of New York, everything, like by the end of this book, it changes so much. And we, you don't know if it's going to survive. This is book one of a series. And that just kind of feels like how New York is now. Like there are think pieces constantly about is New York done? Is New York going to come back from COVID? How is working from home going to affect, you know, New York? And a lot of people being like, New York bounces back. But will it this time? We don't know. We're still in the Mm -hmm. middle of it. And just that hope and like, 
appreciation for New York. I don't know how to describe it other than like you have to live there for a while to get past the kind of sheen of New York that's like going to visit for two weeks kind of thing. It's, sure. you know, getting past the touristy stuff and things like that. Which, which is something that kind of came up right at the beginning of the book, too. Yeah. You know, was we, we had, um, you know, Manny was like, this is his first time in the city and, you know, but he's coming there to live there, but he's still interacting with it as a newcomer. Mm -hmm right away and so like the touristy like aspect of that uh was something that was addressed kind of head on yeah i i really appreciate that she's not anti new new yorkers because new yorker new york is such a blend of either you've lived there your entire life and thus you're a true new yorker you've lived there for 20 some odd years but are you a real new yorker and then there's <laughs> i i never was a true new yorker like I hit some check boxes where I you could be like meet me here and I didn't have to google what subway to take and that was great but I also still would occasionally get on a subway going the wrong way mm. because of things like I'm paying attention to my audiobook or podcast or something like that and damn it now I'm in Brooklyn I meant to go to Manhattan <laughs> um but yeah it's just like I Manny's great because he is brand new and but he's not made to feel less like it's not like a weird mm -hmm. why are you Manhattan? Because for so many people, especially people who look at New York as like, I would love to live there. They want to live in Manhattan. They don't want to live in New York. They want to live in Manhattan. They think that that's <laughs> the awesome thing. So I, I just I really did appreciate Manny as like a stand in for that. Yeah. The um the thing that really struck me like the connection that I kept making um, wasn't so much about like like COVID and you know the the times that we're living through specifically right now but like my my way of 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 interfacing with the world has become dominated by the work that I do in the transportation activism world sure. you know and so like there's like a lot of you know of course transportation you know ties in with housing and you know land usage and stuff like that and and there was a lot of those urbanist concepts mm -hmm. that were you know front and center in this book of like oh yeah gentrification like uh uh buy like these these shadowy companies buying up a whole bunch of of land and then like developing it and like you know what are we like who's who's going to be have a say in like how we use all of this stuff and um you know community art uh uh projects that you know like are are uplifting voices from within the community versus like you know art that is about the city but doesn't really understand it mm -hmm. or like has a really uh, toxic take, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, this, like that is, ooh, like th <laughs> that kept giving me tingles because it was like, uh, oh, and especially, oh my God, um, Staten Island, like all of the, oh. the, oh, all of the Staten Island chapters, every time that I listen to one of those, um, ooh, it like, I, I, I was trapped in this, like, just thinking about, George Floyd and all of the police, uh, you know, like changes that that Minneapolis is trying to make to its police department and everything. Oh God, um, yeah, you were going through all that while listening to this. That's yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> that was yeah, that was that was kind of the the lens through which uh, <laughs> through which this this book existed in my mind. <laughs> I just had like ten thoughts while you were talking because. All these things that you really enjoyed are things that I do enjoy, but it's also things that became such a part of my life. Like, so the neighborhood that I lived in was Sunset Park uh, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. It's in South Brooklyn. And there's Industry City, which is trying to be like the next big thing. Like, it's the first avocado bar in the country and all that bullshit. It's, it's <laughs> awful. And like, I, there was at least one bill that was protested while I lived there. And there was just another round like a week ago, maybe two. And it was so exciting and also hurt a lot because it was like, oh, I'm not there fighting for my neighborhood anymore. And because they were trying to pass some bill because it's going to bring jobs in and everything. It's not. It's not. These businesses close at 6 p.m. and it's bullshit. It's not helping the neighborhood at all. Um, 
so that was where my mind went first was the gentrification of Sunset Park, um, which I am a white woman. Like I am part of that issue, but I love mm-hmm. that neighborhood so much. It is just when when you think of New York, you think nightclubs and busy and things like that. And like this was families and Tai Chi in the morning and soccer fields and just like life. It I don't know. It was people sitting on their steps, the bodega families that I knew, I, like all of that kind of stuff. That's the part of New York I love. I hate nightclubs and things like that. <laughs> um, but I also now on Instagram, a lot of my Instagram has become local neighborhood artists and things like that. Like there's a woman that crochets and knits things and hangs them. Like we had this big sign that was like, wash your damn hands in Spanish mm. that like got put up during COVID and um, graffiti artists and things like that. And just watching them do their work and then being able to go see it was just, it's amazing. It was honestly part of that Pokemon Go is what got me into that because like <laughs> I got out to explore my neighborhood and thus fell in love with it more. But yeah, like that is that is New York for me at least. Yeah, and that's like it, I also think about like what kinds of, you know, how do we how do we build a space that encourages people to be able to interface with that kind of thing? Um and you know, this is transportation advocacy <laughs> Ian, you know, thinking about, oh yeah, if we if we have a city like, you know, the Twin Cities that is everything's built for you to like drive around, um, you know, like you're never going to be out of your car to just like randomly encounter stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you've got um a city like New York City where like transit is is more of an option and you know just being able to walk to different things because stuff is close enough uh then like yeah you'll have you'll you'll be able to see an interface with uh more parts of your community no i agree i agree i um i don't know if you've read anything i don't my facebook is still like they just keep throwing new york news at me it's like it can't quite figure out where i'm located yet um <laughs> But because of COVID, all the outdoor seating and things like that, um, which shuts down parts of the roads. And, of course, one of the things that New York's known for is how congested it is. Yeah. But apparently they are putting in laws and things where these outdoor seatings and these roads that have been shut down will continue to be for outdoor seating. So I am really excited because – I am of the belief that New York is going to bounce back. I left for my leaving had nothing to do with the pandemic. Um, There was a mass exodus because of the pandemic. I was planning to leave beforehand, personal reasons. But I can't wait to go back because my job is still in New York. And I can't wait Mm -hmm. to go back to see how it's changed because of all of this. And hopefully, I mean, we have the, the bikes you can rent, which were coming down towards South Brooklyn and that was always a thing that I debated because the subway station is an oven. And it was like, Hmm. do I learn how to bike four miles over a bridge? That being the worst part. Can't do bridges yet. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) For several reasons. One, they don't seem like an incline. And then you're like, oh, this is such a bitch. It's like a very long (laughs) incline. And two, I just don't do water. But yeah, well, if you when when if and when you uh you know go back to visit New York City like um we'll we'll definitely have to make a field trip of it. Yes, definitely. I want to I'm I'm inviting myself along. You are more than welcome to come along. We'll get Frankie up there too. Get Frankie and John for, John for you. And uh and whoever else wants to come. Um I just going back to what you said about Staten Island. So, I don't know if you know anything about Staten Island. But it is not... I know a heck of a lot now, more now than I ever <laughs> wanted to, <laughs> apparently. So you can't reach Staten Island from Manhattan in a car. You have to take the ferry, which is free. Um, but Oh, that's nice. To get to Staten Island, you have to drive through Brooklyn and then take a bridge. And it is the burbs. It is essentially the burbs of New York. And it is the red part of New York mm. City. It's very strange. I went to a Staten Island... One time that wasn't me just driving through, and that was because I took the ferry to see the Statue of Liberty. So, ah, yeah, very strange, but yeah, like as where in most of New York, having a car is a really dumb idea. Um, Staten Island, you, you need a car, there's not really subways and things like that. 
I think maybe one subway goes there, but that's a lot of underwater. I wasn't going to try it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very yeah, it's very interesting that that like you've got this burrow where the only viable way to get around is really with a car, but then it's not connected by any car infrastructure to mm-hmm. Manhattan, which I think I mean that might be like part of the key for why that is, but it also seems super backwards. <laughs> it's a very strange thing. I don't I'm sure there actually is history and stuff behind that. I don't know it. The only thing I know is that mm-hmm. the Staten Island will always be Staten Island ferry will always be free. It's never going to cost. So. Awesome. Yeah, and like the the I always was taking note as as I was listening to the book, like I was taking note of like what transportation options they chose for different trips that they were making you know Mm -hmm. um you know sometimes they were in a taxi sometimes they were taking the bus sometimes uh uh well you know subways yeah sometimes uh um staten island i forget what her character name is um uh it is tried to take the ferry i believe iceland yeah um she tried to take the ferry a couple of times but uh couldn't do it (laughs) yeah there's a lot of like Staten Island actually has gotten kind of weird because a lot of Brooklyn has retired into Staten Island. And I am wondering if that's causing shifts to the makeup and things like that. Because, like, I I have friends that live in Staten Island that all own property in Williamsburg and, like, sold that property and thus moved to Staten Island. So I don't – it's a weird shift. I don't know what's going on there. Um, But, yeah, unless you, like, don't – unless you work in the city – Staten Island can pretty much survive on its own. It's got, Mm. you know, everything you need. I don't know. I don't particularly agree with it, but that's fine. (laughs) Yeah. And it's, uh, I mean, I live in an area where the, the geography of the city doesn't really constrain like urban sprawl at all, you know? So we have the, we have the city cores of, of Minneapolis and St. Paul. And then, lots and lots and lots of um suburbs just expanding out in every which direction you know as far as you can imagine um you know i i have i have freaking i have co-workers at harding high school who commute in from wisconsin Oof. um yeah exactly uh and i don't understand nor agree with you know <laughs> the the things that went into that decision um but like yeah then then you think about something like new york city where okay obviously the ocean that's a a pretty hard and fast barrier to expanding in that direction um you've you've got you know all of these different boroughs that are separated from each other by stretches of water that you can build bridges over but like you know that costs a lot more than brooklyn and queens are connected just they uh, that is one big thing and it is connected to long island but yes manhattan is an island brooklyn queens and Mm -hmm. Long Island is an island. And then I think the Bronx is an island. I went to the Bronx twice. The Bronx is where you go for good Italian food. And if you want to watch the Yankees play, neither of which I care for. So (laughs) I just didn't go to the Bronx. Also, now living in South Brooklyn, like that is a haul. That is like a two and a half hour commitment of a commute. Oh, sure. Um, Well, yeah, when I was like solely based on the, the personalities of the the avatars for the different boroughs and like and and seeing what kinds of things were like priorities in their lives Mm -hmm. um i i think that the bronx would be like where i would feel most comfortable living if i was to live in new york city um because it it feels like most similar to the neighborhood in saint paul where i live um which is like you know because like the themes of trying to resist like gentrification and uplifting like local voices um was was it seemed like that was the biggest in in bronca's uh uh chapters i agree the only thing though that i can say to that is the fact that we are both white we are going to be gentrification oh for sure so yeah. and that and that's like and that's that is the case the big line where it's like I want to help my neighborhood. However, I am a white woman and this is a Spanish and Chinese neighborhood. I am the problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I live in Frogtown in St. Paul, which is, you know, like I, I'm 
my house is probably one of like two on my block with with white people living in it mm-hmm. um and you know but i i moved here from the east side which is also like majority minority and you know they're both like very they're they're pretty much the lowest income areas of the city um which is why i moved here because <laughs> i'm a public school teacher who's you know working point eight time and i can't afford to own a house anywhere else <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that was the thing was i didn't want a roommate because i had lived on my own for three years prior and was like where can i find a place that is relatively low crime and i can afford an apartment on my own mm-hmm. and added bonus before my or four blocks from a hospital so that's how I ended that, up in that my is neighborhood. Not a consi- that's not a consideration that I usually <laughs> <laughs> think about. <laughs> when you end up in it one too many times, it's just something that you're like, it's just nice to know where it is. <laughs> um, and also the fact that like I wanted some kind of park, some to be close mm-hmm. to a park. Mm-hmm. Um, and Sunset Park is a tiny one, but it was enough to kind of keep me from banging my head on urbanism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I can I can definitely tell you that like gentrification is a thing that we are struggling with hardcore here in Frogtown because like when when we bought our house uh three years ago, you know, it was it was valued at a hundred and seventy thousand dollars. And now uh the the latest like assessment that the county has sent me is that it's worth two hundred and thirty thousand dollars. So like the property oh taxes have have gone up by quite a lot uh <laughs> another reason i will continue to rent it's fine it's fine <laughs> well i mean those property taxes really get like trickled down to you sure one way or another fine. but my washing machine's going to need to be replaced again or a plumber is going to have to come out and fix something and i'm still not going to have to pay for it it's great yeah <laughs> or or even like deal with having to yeah. like figure that out yeah i just have to work up the courage to like talk to the maintenance guy and be like, yeah, I know you've replaced it once, but it's still not working. Mm. Um, I just have a spouse who, you know, deals with all of that, <laughs> but also is like super annoyed with my refusal to deal with any like <laughs> <laughs> home ownership uh, type things. I have a friend who one of the basis of their marriage is that he will talk to the he will take on the anxiety things that of like talking to people that they know. So like if there's a confrontation of their friends, he'll deal with it mm-hmm. as long as his wife deals with the confrontation slash dealing with people that they don't know. And I just was like, <laughs> that is such a perfect marriage. If you are looking for a book, like a recent book that talks about gentrification, especially in New York, particularly in Brooklyn, um, Alyssa Cole's uh, when no one is watching just came out a couple weeks ago and mm. is um, marketed as um, rear window meets uh, get out. And we, we actually did it for judging book covers because we, I loved it so much. And I had an advanced copy and was like, Stephanie, I need you to read this so we can just sit and talk about it. And, but it also talks about like gentrification on more of like a th- 30,000 level, 30,000 foot level. Um, and how it comes in waves and like, especially New York, that is, you know, a very liberal, New York City is a very liberal area, still has a shitty past. And like the way that gentrification like is really fucked up. Um, so yeah, just if you're looking for something else fun, that is also going to teach you a lot about gentrification. That's a good book too. That also is based in New York. And I definitely I, I listened to that episode of Judging Book Covers and I highly enjoyed it. So, oh, I'm so uh, I'll sorry. put a link I'll put a link to that in uh the show notes for this one so people can find it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um yeah, what else what else about the city we became? So there the kind of overall story is that there each city has an avatar as it kind of becomes more permanent. And the New York avatar is in a coma, which leads to each borough kind of having this avatar spring up to save it before we lose New York City Mm -hmm. and potentially the world. And so there is one for each borough. And it's kind of cool. We've discussed Manny, who is a biracial guy that literally walks off a train 
becomes Manhattan and doesn't remember his past. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, again, so perfect. Because New York is where people go to like remake themselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. I That was not why I went to New York. And I have so much respect because I went to New York with an actual job. Like I went with a job, nine to five job that with a steady paycheck that again, allowed me to be able to rent an apartment on my own, which is not something a lot of people do. And to be anybody that's like, I'm going to go and make my name in New York City, like good for you. That is an anxiety level that I can't handle. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, then we have Brooklyn who is MC free, who is like this best, like this progression of a woman who was a rapper and then became a lawyer and is now a city councilwoman. And like, I don't know. I kind of love this whole like arc that she has before we even meet her. Yeah. 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 She, (laughs) if I were to compare that arc to like anybody here in St. Paul, uh, we, we have a city council member who like, she used to have a podcast about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. She is the coolest freaking person ever. That is so cool. <laughs> That's so amazing. I'm also going to need to know that podcast. I've tried to find it. It's not online anymore. And it makes me Damn so it. sad. Smart of her. But Damn it. Yeah, probably <laughs> for the best. <laughs> um, We briefly touched on the Bronx, which is Bronca. She's... The oldest woman, she's indigenous, um, she's queer, she's got a PhD, she works for, like, art. I keep wanting to say scholarships, that is not the correct word. A nonprofit. Yes. Like a incubator? No. Ooh, that's waste too VC. Um, Someone who, like, gives a fellowship, I guess, maybe a better word? Yeah. There's a better word for this, but basically, like you said, lifting up local voices. And they like it's it's a home for the art, but also like literally is a home for a lot of the artists yes. who they're working with. Yeah. Um. So that was like that felt very very real to me. Yeah. It's um. She's also kind of like she knows everything. Like I guess she's probably been the Bronx the long the longest, and like has all the knowledge of the city, and kind of occasionally looks at them like, God, you're still struggling with this? Come on. <laughs> um, I've, then we meet Staten Island, which is Iceland. I'm never going to pronounce her last name. It's an Irish last name. I'm not going to try. <laughs> and it is likely the most stereotypical character because she has an Irish father cop who's super abusive and trying to marry her off to like a super abusive Nazi guy. And also like, 30 years old living with her mom or parents still like but also i know this person like this is a staten island person i know so it's like yeah (laughs) is it wrong and but i like her character in a lot of ways i don't like having to grapple with the concept of her character that's fair but But she's yeah I, i I like it a lot. I felt really icky every time that I like finished one of her chapters. Yeah. <laughs> it's And then Queens. Yes, and then Queens, who is Padmini um Prakesh, I think is her last name, who is an immigrant, mathematician, still in school. Yeah, she's doing her like graduate mm-hmm. program or something. Yeah, like she's that. like mid early mid twenties. Yeah, um, but she's but she's been living in New York with her aunt mm-hmm. f- since she was a little kid. Yes. Yeah. But is not. I mean, she is. She's not a green card. She's, you know, what a lot of New York City is. <laughs> mm. Um, and they all have those like, you know, the these powers that they can use and and deal with. It kind of comes from this almost kind of stereotype of a different type of New Yorker. I hate the word stereotype because it it has such a bad connotation, but here I don't mean it in a bad connotation mm. because it it is exactly like they are avatars as, and that is a stereotype because this is something that you would see in New York. Yeah. Um yeah, let's let's dig into that a little bit more. Like what like what specifically 
have they been doing in the book that that you saw was like oh yeah new yorkers would totally do that i mean i guess just the breakdown of each character like most and each one of them like their powers come from slightly different places that are like based on their personalities yeah like brooklyn hers is really rooted in music because yeah she was a rapper and i guess in some ways like she's kind of the progression of the changes of Brooklyn in that you didn't go to Brooklyn. Like the stereotype was you didn't go to Brooklyn unless, especially not at night, you know, and it's mm. really quote unquote cleaned up over the years. It's gentrified. It's not really cleaned up. It's just gentrified. And that's kind of the vibe of her like career almost is that she was this like really amazing underground rapper and doesn't really want to talk about it. Like, don't bring it up. <laughs> and now as this councilwoman, like, how different that is in the two. Mm-hmm. Um, but while still also trying to preserve all these things that we really love about Brooklyn. And that is the art scene, the music scene, and the people that have come out from that. And it's crazy. Like, this is so pointless. But it was so funny to me that my my parents went to New York um, at least once a year before I moved up here because the U S opens here in big tennis family. And ah. yet they had like never gone to Brooklyn. And I went to, so I had friends um, get married and I think it was 2013 in New York because they had finally allowed gay marriage and they were like, we're going to go do it. And we all went up for like a week. And I was like, I've never been to Brooklyn. I'm just going to like pick a neighborhood in Brooklyn and I'm going to find an Airbnb and stay in Brooklyn. And it was terrifying. And I fell in love with Brooklyn so much because of it. It's just (laughs) such a different, I mean, all the outer boroughs are so different from Manhattan. Um, So yeah, it just, anybody, if you actually haven't been to New York, please just like go actually, don't just go to Manhattan. And there's plenty of touristy things out in the other boroughs stuff, too. So it's not like you need to just go walk around. But I digress. Um, yeah. Do, do a little bit of planning <laughs> beforehand, I imagine, yes. would be a good idea. But <laughs> Yeah. My favorite thing. So, again, this is a digression. But um, my doctor, one of the reasons that I moved back is, is because I had a really great doctor here who did. Um, he was a doctor in New York prior to moving down here. And he was like, I met up with him. And he was like. Yeah, we're not going to go this year because of everything going on. He was like, do you miss the food already? It's like so much, so much. You can just get like almost anything you want. You can't find good Southern food and you can't find good Indian food outside of like East Queens. But so much good food. But that kind of also lends into like the fact that Queens is like a very young and up and coming kind of like. Queens has become the new go-to, which, like, Brooklyn was, Mm. I guess, 10 years ago or whatever. Um, And it does, I think, have a higher, like, Asian population as opposed to – I don't – I honestly don't know. I feel like it's kind of all blended between Brooklyn and Queens, but that's what I get from the food vibe, at least. I don't know. Um, You know, you you mentioning, like, how things have changed since, like, 10 years ago made me think about, like, the the timing of the the setting of this book, you know, that, like, the the whole concept behind it is that, um, you know, New York, the city, is now, like, awakening and becoming this, like, embodied city, Mm -hmm. which is, like, you know, in in the mythology of of this this universe, like, once a, a city has established its own like identity its own personality enough then it like you know is birthed and becomes there an avatar um you know represents it and everything um and it, i don't know like 2020 seems like an uh, a strange time for that to be happening within the universe because like i feel like <laughs> new york city has had an established identity for quite a while um being you know being a, a 28 year old like uh, everything like new york city is just like what i've always understood to be like oh yeah if if you want something that's like set in america that's like you know it's either new york or it's the cornfields right yeah. exactly <laughs> um so like i don't know i it how do you, how do you feel about that 
Um, there is no right. I'm going to start with there is no right answer to that because. For sure. <laughs> you know, there was the whole cleanup in the 90s, the Disney-fied New York. And a lot of people think that that ruined New York. Um, I only went to New York once prior to 9-11. And I was 10 at the oldest, maybe 11. So I don't really remember it. But what they told me about New York when I was little was that everybody's really mean and they're all in their own like bubble and just like they're not going to help you and they're going to be really gruff and so like if you get lost stand still like because no one's going to help you find your parents kind of thing um by the way got left lost in new york as a child it's still (laughs) a scarring (laughs) thing um as where after 9-11, the city kind of took on a different vibe where it was like, shit, we're kind of all in this together and you're still going to get plenty of people that are like, I'm in my own bubble, leave me alone. But I also had a lot more people that like, if you got off a subway looking confused, they would stop and be like, do you need help? And mm. so it's, I don't know, I guess the vibe has become such a like, New York's going to survive that I guess that's kind of more of its identity rather than it's just another gross or rough city where you're going to find sex workers and, you know, porn shops and blah, blah, blah. And like, whatever, that's fine. Um, There are aspects of that in every city. And yeah, (laughs) I don't know. I, (laughs) I don't know if it has come into its own identity other than the fact that like, 9-11 9-11 happens and what mm. that caused the change who knows who knows it's, i mean it's pretty hard for something like that to not be a catalyzing event right. for you know broad change yeah it, it's definitely going to take on a new identity after this as well mm-hmm. um, after covid meaning and um i don't know i just i remember there was like a bombing or something when I lived there and people like there was two because there was the actual bombing that was in Manhattan that I got like 20,000 text messages. And I was like, guys, I live in South Brooklyn. It's Sunday at 9 PM. Like, I don't know who you think you're texting, but I'm not out. (laughs) And then there's the pressure cookers that they found. One of them might have gone off. I can't remember, but they found like at my subway stop and like where I got off for work and they like shut that down. Um, and instead of being scared, my vibe became like, God damn it. Now I've got to go up another subway stop and then walk back and like, shit, I, <laughs> what if they send me over to like East, you know, Manhattan? Like, I don't remember quite how to get back to work from there. And like, you just, you adapt. Like that's New York. It's just how quickly can you adapt? And that's how you're going to survive. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm proud of you for becoming New York. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> No, it definitely changed me, and I still love it. It's just not close to my family. That's the only problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, I so I listened to the audio book. Um, were you reading it in text? No, I listened to the audio book. Yeah. yeah, let's gush about that for a minute. It's so great. Ooh, it's so good. Um, the narrator. I should have looked up who she is before we recorded this, but the narrator is amazing. You can keep vamping and... if you want. I can give it to you in a second. <laughs> and like they they put in just enough bits of like added sound effects and you know audio stuff to like, but but it wasn't over the top. Um, I feel like it was just the right amount, uh, to make it really good. So I always ask people, and I probably have asked you this before, what what do you listen to audiobooks at like is it a one speed two speed what what is oh, your sure. comfort level um i mean if i'm listening to like a non-fiction uh book like i'll bump it up to like 1.75 2x you know depending on the narrator um for stuff that's like that's that's narrative uh i usually stick at like 1.5 okay i'm somewhere in the middle there too so the narrator was Robin Miles, who also did a book that I just bought. So now I'm like, cool, I should get that on audiobook too. <laughs> oh, and another book that I love. I love when I find like, I lo- audiobook narrators are just as fun and 
help me decide if I want to read a book as like the author who writes it. Yeah, which is a really like that's a really strange place to be in yes. because it's <laughs> um well, I guess, okay, I guess it's not so strange because, like, you know, a lot of times you'll see a movie trailer and you'll be like, well, I know that actor. I don't know who wrote the movie, but, like, I know that that actor is good. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we all know that good actors are never in bad movies. I know, right? Like, never. Not at all. <laughs> never make bad decisions. Never just need a paycheck. <laughs> yeah. Um. I Yeah, I don't remember, like, particulars about, like, um. you know, what, what like what the the narrator was doing like you know with with the affectation that she gave to each different character like i don't remember specifics about what i liked about any of that but i just remember like being really taken in by her portrayal of this story yeah i think that that in and of itself speaks volumes like you don't really want to remember what the differences were you just want to kind of breathe in the story and it is the added extra things that like there are some zany, for lack of a better word, sound effects that go in. Um, there's subway noises at one point. Like there's, mm -hmm. you know, the subway calling to go to the next stop and they actually use that kind of um, – I totally just blanked on what I was talking about. Oh, my God. They use that sound effect. What? Yeah, like the, the MTA, Yes. you know, ding, dinging or whatever that they use to get your attention. Exactly. Um Oh, and there were also some things that were, like, really important to the plot as well that they use sound effects for. Like, um, when when the enemy, like, you know, she, she's got this creature that she calls on every once in a while that, like, its signature is that, like, it, it makes this, like, unintelligible sound that, like, we as humans can't comprehend mm -hmm. because this is a multidimensional being kind of thing. And they, like, they had this really, like, low, subtle... Like not quite a heartbeat, not quite like a. It's like a it almost thump. sounded like a, like something that you could kind of make with your throat, maybe. Yes. Like in the back of your throat, but but not quite. It's like a weird absence of sound, almost. It's so hard to explain. I have no idea yeah. how they made this sound. It's probably on a computer somewhere, but like, yeah, that is an excellent sound. Would love to hear an interview with the the sound designer for that Definitely. for that audio book. Definitely. That would be a really cool thing to like, like a podcast series is like to get people that do audiobooks to do, like talk about it. Yes. <laughs> I would listen to that. I am such a nerd. Like a, li a little brother uh, version of 20,000 20, Hertz. Yes. <laughs> we haven't really talked about the enemy much, the woman in white. Right. Yeah. Um, which is really funny. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, it's there. Like we're going down FDR and suddenly there's like tentacles white tentacles everywhere yeah this like the whole okay so so like multi-dimensional like you know incomprehensible like you know <laughs> unknowable stuff in in fiction um is always like like of course because it's unknowable like the 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 author can kind of do whatever they want with it, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> um, so it's always, it's always kind of like, you know, you, you, you feel like you've read stories like this before, but then it's like, Oh wait, no, they're going in a totally different direction than I was expecting yes. here. You know, like, like you, you definitely wouldn't think, Oh yeah. One of the agents of one of, one of the ways that this, enemy is going to be manifesting itself is through like having a multinational corporation that is buying up real estate and changing it into stuff that is that is more malleable from her perspective mm -hmm. um and yeah the i i felt kind of uncomfortable with like the concept of like oh yeah when it when a city is born it like destroys other stuff in other yeah. dimensions. Cause I was like, Oh, I mean, we need cities and we do but like, but like, you know, like, Ooh, like what, what gives us the right, you know, <laughs> to, to be, you know, messing stuff up for, for other dimensions. Like, Ooh. but that's the nature of dimensions. Like that's Is why it? they I exist. Don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> multi-dimension especially multi-dimension horror is not my forte it's just not i don't know yeah i guess i mean yeah for for the sake of of 
of drama for conflict you know of course there has to be like a zero-sum game um you know like and but me me in my life in the world like i'm always trying to look for ways that like can't we all be winners can't we all be friends we can't that's no no but like but megan can't we no why not because if everything is good then it becomes content and thus it's not good you have to have your peaks and valleys (laughs) sorry i just i like having just a constant buzz of contentment (laughs) (sighs) it would be wonderful to live in your world for a couple days because i never have that (laughs) I never have that. I actually had a therapy session (laughs) where uh, I was like, I'm having a great week, but yet I have this constant anxiety that something bad's about to happen. And then the RBG died. And I was like, well, Mm. that didn't help. (laughs) Well, I think it's safe to say that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't your fault. No, I don't think it was my fault. (laughs) My mother's now wondering if I'm an oracle, but (laughs) that's just a whole different. (laughs) Yeah. And it's... um... I mean, of course, like, since since the characters, well, the humans in this world, like, have no way of interfacing with any of the rest of those, you know, other dimensional aspects that, like, you know, it's it, like, can they can they really be be held accountable for creating cities that like, you know, like, we're just doing what's natural for us, um, yeah. which is, hmm, that's a theme that also comes up in Animorphs, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, animorphs yeah yeah we can talk a lot of philosophy i actually have a note to reread this book which i meant to do and every time i started it i was like i am not at the level to deal with the metaphors and philosophy that this book's gonna throw at me because it, it, it throws a lot for something that is so fun and whimsical in its mm-hmm. horror on the surface but it is very deep and intricate yeah. And I've like I've been recommending it to a lot of my friends who, you know, work in the in the, in the advocacy spaces that I do oh, that's because smart. I'm like I'm like this this piece of fiction is going to like it, it might not give you any new insights about, you know, should we change public process so that more people have input on these transportation infrastructure like blah 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 like nothing so specific as that, but like it like it's gonna hit real close to home Mm -hmm. and (laughs) and that might like you know having something like that that is also set in a fictional world where like the consequences the conflict is different than what we're dealing with in the real world that might be good for us right now (laughs) yeah yeah it's hard to deal with anything that feels real right now i all agree yeah yeah that that um constant buzz of contentment that i mentioned earlier um haven't felt that in a few months oh bud in quite a few months i'm so sorry uh hopefully it'll come back someday soon i have faith well i want to have faith we'll go with it that way (sighs) winter's coming though so just don't get married don't go to any weddings i don't know if you were actually making a game of throne reference I was half making a Game of Thrones reference and half just being like, well, Minnesota. Yeah. (laughs) The ending of this is weird, and I really want the second book. And I think I'm going to hold off on rereading this until the second comes out, which hasn't been announced, but there's definitely going to be a second. Mm. I mean, there has to be. There has to be, yes. (laughs) The way this ends. I keep going back and forth with like, there has to be, right? Like this, this ends with a cliffhanger, but does it end with a cliffhanger? But it does, right? Like, I think it does. It does. Um. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, definitely. But then also, like, does it? I mean, we get to see we get to see all of our characters hanging out together, yes. like you know, just kind of, just kind of chilling. Uh, and so it's like things are okay, at least for now. Yes. And there's this little bitty. There's like one line where it's like, oh no, it won't be great for long. Mm-hmm. I also really enjoy the like the epilogue where it's like they're in Coney Island celebrating on July 9th because that is. When New York declared independence, we may have declared it on July 4th, but New York did it on July 9th. And I was like, I appreciate that. That's great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The ending of this was the sort of thing where it was like, well, we we beat we beat this threat. Yes. But we also learned that this particular threat is like the least of our concerns. Yes. Like, 
like she she was like a young you know not very powerful version of whatever threat she represents we do actually find new york too who is a black homeless queer guy that's an artist right, and a hustler right. and i mean literally open the book with new york this is not a spoiler um and there is the short story which i think is also the prologue of this book i think the short story is part of the book yes yes where where new york's like primary avatar uh has to get um paulo's like help yes with just like hiding right yeah yes yep and we do get to see other cities that's really cool like the avatars for these like really established cities mm-hmm. and yeah no i'm excited i i there's literally nothing about book two like there's not an announcement or anything like that i'm sure it'll be mm. two or three years before we hear anything i'm really curious to see if it's going to be new york again or if it's going to focus on another city and what city that would be <laughs> I mean, given that like the like the primary avatar, we only got to see him in like two chapters. You know, I feel like it's still gonna be uh, New York City. I hope so. Be- <laughs> because like we haven't gotten to know that character at all. No, no. Yeah. I mean, they were still learning who they are at the end. Yeah, yeah. Like refeeling their skin, kind of like adapting. It's I, I love this book so much. i did i did find it kind of strange that like the 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 other city that was helping them out was sao paulo and um because like the whole the like uh, going back to the concept of like oh yeah once a city has like established its own personality uh its own identity enough then it like becomes uh a properly realized you know avatar and i um i mean this is probably like definitely speaks to to my smaller worldview as a minnesotan like you know i'm like what is what what even is sao paulo like what what kind of personality does that city have i don't like it hasn't permeated in like my understanding of the world in in the media scape of you know that that i have encountered do you know what country Um, it's in at least yes i know it's in brazil thank you very much as someone who got a D in geography, like I had to just double check that it was in Brazil. Like that was not a slam. <laughs> but if if you asked me to name like, oh yeah, what is what do you think is like the most significant um or culturally significant like city in Brazil, I probably wouldn't even say Sao Paulo. I might say Rio, you know? Like I don't know. <laughs> no, I agree, but from what it looks like, it is the largest city in Brazil. Okay. So yeah, I mean I, I I'm curious as to why it was picked and because I know next to nothing about it, honestly. Yeah. But I also know next to but, nothing about Brazil because, um, yeah. It's definitely the the country in South America that I know the least about because I went to a Spanish immersion school, and so oh. like, <laughs> when we're talking about South America, um, you know, the Spanish speaking countries are focused on a lot more <laughs> that's fair that's fair. So, so wait are you actually like bilingual am i actually learning um, something new y- about you after all this time y- yeah i mean um i'm pretty darn rusty because <laughs> i haven't actually like i've just i wasn't been gonna doing, make like, you talk it i'm just i was curious one yeah. duolingo uh lesson like a day just to like <laughs> not completely lose everything that's fair. um but yeah very cool do we have any other big final thoughts for the city we became nothing that won't just be a major spoiler and i just don't want to do that (laughs) yeah but i think it's a good mixture of urban fantasy magical realism if you like both of those or if you're trying to get into one of those here's a good starting point yeah i i found it definitely like very approachable Mm -hmm. um you know like even if you are not used to having this like really like high concept multi-dimensional sci-fi stuff thrown at you yeah i did forget about that part (laughs) which is always like yeah it's 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 interesting because it's like like multi-dimensional stuff is always like okay it 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 is like science fiction but also like it's not really based on any science that we understand currently so it's like it really is fantasy it's, yeah, you know. <laughs> I mean, where is the line between sci-fi and fantasy, really? Right. Yeah. It's. 
but it's not like a space opera because you know it's right. still here in our current world yeah in a version of our current world yeah well yeah i mean the way 2020 I'm, is going i would actually not be surprised if like this is happening this is the october of 2020 <laughs> shit way to predict that although if if i were to pick anywhere that you know i wouldn't be surprised to hear about like white tentacles coming out of the ground and attacking people um i would pick florida that's fair (laughs) yeah yeah and then we can just blame it on a florida man it's always his fault it's always a florida man's fault (laughs) damn hurricane washed up something who knows who knows um okay meg can you tell everybody where they can find you on the internet sure uh, I host a couple podcasts that um, are still pretty much up and running, and those are Judging Book Covers podcast, which is a biweekly book club podcast. Um, we tend to do a book like challenge um, to kind of help us really branch out from what we normally read, um, because uh, me and Stephanie, my co-hosts, have very similar reading habits. Um, 2020 has kind of screwed all of that up so it's a lot of like we're reading for comfort in some ways um the other podcast that i co-host is minds at yerk which is a deep dive into the 90s series animorphs um with a friend who has read them that doesn't quite remember them and a friend who has never read them and enjoys them quite a bit (laughs) um i also have a blog and yeah all of that good stuff. I'm all over social media. So. Woo. Yeah. And I'm Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. This episode of Second Opinion is released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so feel free to use any or all of it as you see fit, as long as you link back to the original page, which once again is thenexus.tv slash SO105. If you would like to discuss this episode with other listeners, please go to our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV. And if you are willing and able to help us financially as we continue to make technology-focused podcasts, you can join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Until next time, have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence. Technology is ever evolving. It touches every part of our lives, both influencing and being influenced by society. I'm Ian Arbuck, and I know it's hard to stay on top of everything you need to know to live in this digital world. That's why every month on the Extra Dimension, we explore a different aspect of the technological convergence. Find it on our website, thenexus.tv, or by searching for The Extra Dimension in your favorite podcast player.